All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today for this class, the first in our series of Judaism and the Animal Kingdom. Today we have here uh, David Lowenstein, who has been a, con a consumer horticulture extension educator with Michigan University for four years. He has a background in entomology and has worked with managing invasive species, integrated pest management, or IPM, of vegetable crops and pests and pollinators in urban agriculture. Originally from New York City, he holds an MS in entomology from University of Wisconsin and PhD in ecology and evolution from the University of Illinois, at Chicago. So welcome, David. Thank you, Emma. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk about entomology uh, as it relates to Judaism and uh, a bit about my background as well. So let's get the correct screen up. All right, we should be seeing the title right now. Excellent. So this is a, a different kind of talk for me. I'm used to professionally talking about insects, but not so much weaving um, insects and Torah and Judaism together. So this is an exciting opportunity for me to uh, try to piece together both of those worlds, the, the Jewish background and the entomology background. And uh, we are a smallish group today, if you're listening live. So if anyone has any questions uh, during our time together, feel free to put those in the chat or raise your hand and we can, um, we can call on you. So I first wanted to give a bit of background about who I am and how did I get into entomology? Uh, it's not very common to meet an entomologist in anyone's day-to-day -day life, and it's even less common to find an entomologist who happens to be Jewish. Uh, so I have a bit of a, I would say, an atypical background at getting into this field, particularly working with plants and agriculture, uh, because I did not grow up on a farm. I did not grow up with any kind of garden or green space. Uh, I grew up in the Bronx uh, in New York City. Uh, in an apartment building. So there were certainly insects in the building, not the kind of insects that anyone wants to find, um, indoor pests. Uh, but I studied biology during my undergraduate years at uh, the City University campus in the Bronx, Lehman College. Uh, and at some point I ended up doing an internship in a lab working with potatoes and potato beetles at the University of Wisconsin. And that led me to want to continue to pursue uh, my interest in entomology, thinking this is an interesting field to work in if you have an interest in science. So I moved to Wisconsin um, and spent two years working with bees that visit pickling cucumber fields in central Wisconsin. There was actually a Jewish connection there because a few of the research sites that I participated in, they were only about a mile away from several Jewish summer camps, like Camp Moshevan, and there was another one nearby. Did not stop by there, but they were just coincidentally uh, located near there. Uh, and then I went for a PhD at the University of Illinois, Chicago, as Emma mentioned. I worked with urban agriculture, the kinds of, looking at the kinds of bees that uh, live in different neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, how they vary between neighborhoods and uh, different kinds of beneficial insects in urban agriculture. Uh, and after that, uh, I moved to Oregon for a couple years working with this small wasp on the screen, which is about the size of a period in the sentence. It's called the samurai wasp, and it lays its eggs in the eggs of brown marmorated stink bugs. And this was a beneficial insect we were trying to release in fruit orchards and hazelnut farms. Uh, so the world of Judaism and entomology, for the most part, were separate, uh, other than the occasional phone call I've, that I might have got once or twice from a group of rabbis to different labs I was in, wanting to know, are the insects and celery or a certain crop in Wisconsin, are they buggy? Uh, so that led me to explain to my supervisor at the time what kind of information they were actually uh, looking for. But being an entomologist and uh, being someone who is an observant Jew uh, are not two things that cannot go together. Really, the only restriction is I don't eat insects at events when there are opportunities to taste insects. So before we get into some of the connection between Judaism and entomology and a couple different terms within 
the insect world, I want to take you first into the lifestyle of an entomologist. Uh, so what, what kind of things might you find if you go into an entomologist's office? Uh, you'll definitely find insects, usually pinned and dead. Uh, so I use these for outreach events and teaching. Uh, I don't hold a research appointment, so I don't have any kind of live insect colonies uh, in my lab. But in the job position that I hold at Michigan State University, I help people solve issues in their gardens, issues related to their trees, their plants, or insects that they might come across. And so there's usually a lot of various plant samples people bring in. Um, sometimes I'll get plants that are long dead and they'll wonder, can you help me figure out what the problem is here? Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to diagnose an issue uh, when you're given a, a plant that is mostly brown and uh, hasn't been alive for uh, a couple days or longer. But I also get better samples too. Uh, I'll get whole leaves, branches, sometimes full plants. Uh, so for example, in this case, these lightened areas in the middle of the leaf are something called chlorosis, which occurs when the pH of the soil is too high for the plant to uptake certain nutrients like iron and manganese. So they can't produce that bright green color that most people are familiar with when they see a maple tree. So perhaps you, you know a little bit about insects, but uh, if you don't, this is gonna be a, a very quick one slide crash course on what is an insect. Uh, so when people think about insects, they think about creepy crawly critters, um, anything that might be small, and oftentimes they probably are insects, uh, but a spider is not an insect, as we'll, we'll see why. So an insect has three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Um, most insects have wings as adults that are connected to the thorax, and all insects have three pairs of legs that are connected to the thorax. They also have antennae that are used for communication, uh, and they have an exoskeleton, like all invertebrates. So their skeleton is on the outside of their body. Spiders have eight legs, and they only have two body parts, a combined head and thorax, called the cephalothorax, plus an abdomen. The insect life cycle uh, can be one of two ways. This here is complete metamorphosis, where an insect lays its eggs in a different location, and those eggs develop into a larvae. So in this case, this is a Japanese beetle. Those eggs become grubs that will feed on the roots of uh, turf grass. And that larvae looks nothing at all like the adult. It lives below the ground, uh, it cannot fly. The adult lives above the ground and feeds uh, on plant leaves. Uh, we also have something called incomplete metamorphosis where the immature life stages of an insect look a lot like the adult, except they don't fly and they cannot reproduce. So the vast majority of insects, they lay eggs, the eggs become a larva, then a pupa, and then an adult. So what kind of things do insects do uh, in our earth? Uh, pretty much everything would be the short answer. Uh, one area a lot of people are familiar with are pollinators. So a pollinator, is any kind of insect that visits a flower and helps transfer the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. And then you get seeds or fruits resulting from that. So vegetables like cucumbers and tomatoes and fruits like apples and watermelons are only able to be produced because of the help of pollinators, specifically different kinds of bees. Uh, then we have our predators. So insects that will directly feed on other small insects. So here's a lady beetle that feeds on uh, an aphid. Uh, lady beetles are a beneficial insect and they um, provide a lot of control against aphids and other soft bodied insects. Then there are herbivores, uh, the pests that most people think about. So any kind of insect that feeds on leaves, it could be an insect that's a caterpillar, it could be a, um, a kind of beetle, uh, or it could be a, a kind of plant bug, uh, which has a piercing sucking mouth part, but also feeds on leaves. And then there's three other 
kinds of things insects do. Uh, so there are insects that are parasitoids, like that samurai wasp I mentioned earlier. That's a special case where the insect completes its life cycle inside uh, of another insect. So in the process of laying its eggs inside of these stink bug eggs here, uh, that stink bug will not develop and a wasp will pop out of each of these 25 or so eggs. And then we have detritivores. I know this isn't an insect on the screen, uh, but a detritivore is something that breaks down organic matter. These are soil dwelling insects. They feed on decaying leaves, um, microbes in the soil. Pretty hard to get pictures of them because most of the action shots for detritivores would take place beneath the soil surface. And uh, we can't really get a, a picture of that. And then of course, there's people that believe that insects who bother us. Uh, and there definitely are insects that are annoying. Uh, I would say most people would agree that mosquitoes are a pain. No one likes to get attacked by a mosquito. Uh, and random fact, you're not actually getting bit by a mosquito. You're actually getting sucked uh, by a mosquito. Mosquito has a sucking mouth part, but that hasn't caught on. And I'm not going to try to change the way people uh, refer to getting attacked by a mosquito. Uh, and this insect here is a mayfly. Anyone who lives near rivers or streams or the Great Lakes um, in the United States or Canada as well, might have seen this insect because they emerge from the water in the thousands to the millions, uh, anytime between May through early July, depending on uh, where you are in North America. So now we're going to shift gears into insects and a couple instances where they are mentioned in uh, the Tanakh, in the Gemara, and maybe some lessons that we can learn from insects and how they might relate to, to Judaism. So I, I will preface by saying I am, my background is in science and entomology. And although I have a, a Jewish day school education, I do not profess myself to be an expert in terms of all the symbology of insects uh, in the Tanakh. But I think we'll still find some examples here today, some of which you might be familiar with and others which will uh, be novel to you. So when we think about insects in the Torah, uh, these two here are probably the most common ones that anyone would consider. Uh, the insects in the 10 plagues in the story of the Exodus from Egypt, the Itziat Mitzrayim. Uh, so lice and locusts, uh, which are referred to uh, in the Torah and of course were a um, major annoyance uh, to the Egyptians, both to their bodies as well as to their fields, uh, and were part of the process uh, that ultimately related to Jewish people being freed from Egypt uh, several thousand years ago. Uh, but this idea of locusts uh, attacking crops uh, is really, it's not far-fetched. Uh, it happens still today um, in the Middle East, in parts of Africa, and even in the United States. Uh, so in severe locust outbreaks, you can get about 390 million locusts per square mile. And locusts are a hungry uh, herbivore that will feed on basically any kind of plant that is present. So I use the word locust here because the insects that we're seeing here are actually crickets. They're called Mormon crickets, but they're closely related to locusts. So all of these black things that you're seeing on the road and they're covering the plants and on some of this ranching fence, uh, fence too. Uh, these are all Mormon crickets. And this is not a picture from the past. This is from the last couple of years. Uh, there was a Mormon cricket outbreak in Nevada and in Eastern, Air, or Eastern Oregon earlier this year. So this insect got its name uh, from devastating the crops of the Mormon community uh, in the mid 1800s in the United States. Uh, so locusts feeding on people's plants, whether that be the Egyptians, the Mormons, um, farmers in the United States today, that is a, a very real issue. Another place that insects feature prominently in the Torah is in the prohibition to eat insects. Uh, so the verse which was first stated in, um, in the portion of the book of Vayikra, and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth is a detestable thing. It shall not be eaten. 
Uh, so shekets, it's a, it's a word that has a, a very negative connotation. Uh, there's actually only one kind of insect uh, that is permissible to be eaten if you follow that culture. Uh, so I believe in the Yemenite and the Moroccan community, there's a species of locust that they do in fact uh, eat. I have not personally uh, eaten that one, but you see a lot more uh, products in the market, especially in the last decade or two, of proteins made from crickets uh, and other insects. Um, but if you hold by this uh, verse in the Torah, it is pretty clear that uh, we are not to consume insects according to a traditional um, practice. Another instance in the Torah where insects are mentioned, and again, in a, a negative light, uh, is discussing a kind of plague where these wasps attacked the uh, inhabitants of the land of Canaan before the Jews lived there. And so the English translation is, I will send a plague ahead of you and it shall drive out before you the Chivim, the Canaanites and the um, Chittites. Uh, so the, the Mishnah in the tractate of Sota actually says that this kind of wasp stung poison uh, in the eyes of the um, Canaanim. It is possible to be stung in the eye uh, by a wasp. Uh, this wasp was probably some kind of yellow jacket or hornet. And when you get stung by a hornet, uh, it hurts. It's not, uh, not pretty pleasant. Uh, there's an entomologist who used to be at the University of Arizona, he passed away recently, and he created this pain index. It was called the Schmidt Pain Index, named after Justin Schmidt. And he got stung by all of these different kinds of uh, insects. And he describes the feeling of pain by each of the insects. And uh, wasps were right in the middle of the, the pack um, in terms of a yellow jacket sting. So definitely painful enough to drive a people uh, away. And then again, this word tzir'ah or uh, wasp is mentioned later in the Torah in the book of Devarim. So insects are not to be eaten and insects can also be used as a form of punishment uh, as we're seeing so far uh, in the Torah. But despite some of these negative aspects of insects, uh, there are quite a few insects that are very important uh, for food security uh, and also for our ecosystem, bees being one of them. Um, I'm most familiar with bees as well because I've spent quite a number of years working on various projects with bees and wasps. So this is a nice poster uh, from the North American uh, Pollinator Protection and Conservation Organization. And uh, these are all different kinds of bees that you can find in North America. So some of the largest bees are carpenter bees, uh, which would be about the size of a thumb. And then the smallest bees would be this one, which would be number 10 over here, uh, Perdita, uh, which are found in the Southwest and really tiny bee about maybe an eighth of an inch or so. So bees come in all different kinds of sizes, uh, different amounts of hair on the body, different colors. And I want to highlight a, a couple of them before we go into uh, some more discussion about bees and honey and its relevance um, from related to Judaism. So the United States has at least 4,000 species of bees. And if you live in the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, you are in the hot spot for bees in the United States. Uh, that mix of Desert and high elevation um, mountains leads to conditions where a lot of bees are found where they are not found elsewhere uh, in North America. Uh, so these are a couple different kinds of groups of common bees. Uh, you can definitely find all of these along the East Coast and much of the Midwest. Um, west of the Rockies, the bees are a little bit different. Uh, the most of my experience has been east of the Rockies. So one really colorful bee is the wool carter bee. Looks a lot like a wasp, uh, but it does have hairs on its body. It collects the pollen beneath its abdomen, which is kind of unusual. This one is not native to North America, originally from Europe. And it's actually an aggressive bee. Uh, it'll attack um, other bumblebees and bees on flowers because it, it's a territorial species that um, wants to find females and doesn't want other species nearby. 
Then there's the Osmia or mason bees. These are a bright metallic colored bee, which are really effective pollinators for blueberries and for cherries. We also have longhorn bees. They get their name because of their slightly longer antennae relative to other bees. Some of them are all black uh, with this stark white contrast of hairs on the legs. Others are more traditional black and yellow across their body, and some of them really love sunflowers. Uh, carpenter bees are a pollinator, but they can also uh, feed on wood. They create these dime-shaped holes that they lay their eggs in. My personal favorite bee is the green sweat bee, just because it's this beautiful, bright green bee. And it is found basically in all kinds of habitats, forests, meadows, prairies, um, vacant lots, community gardens, backyards, middle of downtown Chicago, you name it, this green bee is probably present. We also have about 20 or so species of bumblebees, uh, the hairy, usually black and yellow bees. And then we have the workhorse of the bee world, the honeybee, uh, which is a domesticated bee species uh, that most people are familiar with because it lives in colonies of 10 to 50,000, and it can be brought to different kinds of crops for uh, pollination. So I'd like to propose the, the point, does, uh, does the bee, and particularly the, the honeybee, does it embody Torah values? And so the bee is an insect, at least the social honeybee, that it works collectively and it has a very strong community aspect, uh, just like in, in Judaism, where um, when we can, we try to pray with a group, with a minion, and bees, they will always live together with a queen. There's no such thing as a honeybee that decides they're going to wake make their own um single hive. They might make a breakaway hive uh, at some point in the season. Um, but similar to the Levium in the, in the temple in the Beit HaMikdash, who had different roles for carrying the poles, handling instruments, uh, bees also have a division of labor. There's worker bees that go out and collect pollen and nectar. There are guard bees that stay in the hive and protect the hive uh, from any potential attackers that are trying to gain access to the honey. Uh, and then there's nurse bees, whose job is to take care of the queen and to take care of the developing offspring, or the babies inside of the nest or the hive, um, by helping them uh, feed on the bee bread, uh, which is brought to them. Uh, bees also have a couple different mentions in Jewish history. Uh, so there is the line about um, then the Amorites who lived in those hills came out against you like so many bees and chased you and they crushed you out at Horma in Seir. So this is uh, from the, the book of Devarim talking about um, an enemy of the Jew who, who came out in large numbers and the, the size of their um, attack was compared to just the size of a bee colony. So 10, 30, 40, 50,000, that's a, a lot of um, individuals. And it really just gets to the scale of how many of these uh, Amorites uh, came out uh, in this battle. There's also an interesting um, mention of bees being found in the carcass of a lion by Shimshon or Samson. Um, so Samson was an, an, a character uh, who had a lot of interesting travels, um, interesting stories about him. And one of these in the Book of Judges mentions a story where he finds um, a Philistine woman uh, and he wants to marry her. So he, as he's returning to go back to um, Pleshet, to Philistine, um, he passes by a lion that he previously had killed. and. He sees inside the, the skeleton or the carcass of a lion, there's a swarm of bees um, and honey within there. He scoops it up and uh, eats some, but doesn't tell anyone uh, about it. So from a, a food safety perspective, not sure that uh, that's something I'd want to recommend, but very unusual to mention a case of honeybees finding a home within the um, carcass of a lion. And I'm sure there are a lot of great explanations in the commentary for what does um, 
this mean? I didn't uh, dig too deeply uh, into that, uh, but this case of bees being found in the, the skeleton or the carcass of a lion uh, has been a really popular theme that different artists have tried to uh, paint over time. So this is just one um, from the 1500s of here's a uh, Shimshon and finding coming across the lion with some bees uh, right next to this dead lion. Uh, there is another case in the Tractate of Sota, which talks about the sweetness of honeybees. And I know there's a lot of text on here, uh, and I'll I'll read some of it, um, but it and I'll paraphrase some of it, but it talks about the sweetness of the the honeycomb or the the nofet sufim and how this um, nofet sufim disappeared when the first temple uh, was destroyed, and in this tractate of Gemara, um, the rabbis discuss, well, what was this, this nofet sufim, this honeycomb-like substance? And they talk about it being a, a fine flower that remains on top of a sieve, uh, similar to dough kneaded with honey and oil. Um, another uh, mention of the nofet sufim being these loaves stuck together uh, in an oven. And then another rabbi, Rabbi Hoshua ben Levi, um, mentions that this was the honey that came from uh, bees that brought back nectar from mountainous areas. And that would make sense knowing the geography of Jerusalem, that it's in the hills and there could have been wildflowers or trees uh, that these bees would have visited and they could have been destroyed with um, the attack from the the Romans, or not the Romans, for the first temple, um, the Babylonians, excuse me. So certainly honey is something that has a beneficial um, explanation. And this nofet sufim is something that unfortunately uh, we only have a description of and are unable to taste. So all the more better must have tasted uh, compared to the honey, which they also had at that time. And I mentioned earlier about insects being prohibited to eat uh, in the Torah, but honey represents this unusual exception that you can eat honey. Uh, every denomination of Judaism, every rabbi would agree that honey is completely uh, kosher. Exactly what kind of honey, if you needed to have a kosher symbol on the, the jar or not, that's something to ask to your uh, local rabbi. Uh, but the reason for that is that honey is not an actual part of the insect, um, but it it's the nectar that the bee ingests from one of its mouth parts, and that nectar goes into a special stomach called the honey stomach or the crop. So this is before the main stomach of the bee, and then that honey interacts with enzymes, uh, and then it's regurgitated um, out of the bee um, back inside the nest, and, and that would be used uh, for feeding um, the um, babies. And if you've seen nectar in a flower, nectar and honey are completely different. Nectar is um, almost like water, but it's sugary water. And honey is very viscous, um, a lot thicker. And, and that's one of the reasons that honey is accepted as an okay product to, to eat um, by all rabbis. So honey is, it's not an actual secretion of an insect. It's not a part of the insect. It's just something from nature that the bee has swallowed and it's refined it to a different product. Um, and this is the point of the Gemara in the Tractate of Bechorot where they discuss that um, the bee is not actually excreting it from their body. Yes, it's coming out of the their mouth parts, but it's not going through their digestive system. It doesn't even make it to that first stomach. It goes just to that um, initial stomach or that honey stomach. And then the uh, Gemara in this uh, segment of Bechorot uh, goes on to talk about whether other kinds of secretions um, are kosher. So that the honeydew from aphids, for example, that is not kosher because that is something that actually get, they digest. But it comes out of their excretory system because it's too concentrated of sugar. So it's a completely different way 
that leaves their body. And then there's a disagreement about whether secretions from wasps are kosher or not. The really the, the honeybee is one of the only bees that produces honey. We have about 20,000 species of bees in the world. There are bumblebees that can produce a limited amount of honey, but nothing else produces honey uh, quite like the uh, honeybee. There's some stingless bees in Mexico that also produce a small amount of honey, but again, not at the same scale. So being that Rosh Hashanah is coming up shortly, or if you're watching this at a later time, maybe it, it passed. I just wanted to talk about my own personal uh, favorite honeys. Uh, so all honey is, is not the same, uh, especially since bees are often brought to pollinate particular crops. The flavor of the honey reflects the flavor of the um, plant that it's visiting. So often what you see in the store would be clover honey, and that's just bees that are visiting wildflowers. Or if you have an urban beekeeper, uh, their honey is often going to be really light um, and a bit sugary as well. So meadow foam is my favorite kind of honey. And if you're thinking about an activity for Rosh Hashanah, a honey tasting is actually a, a great idea. There's still time to purchase different kinds of them. Uh, so meadow foam is a plant that's grown almost exclusively in Oregon and a little bit in Washington. And it's grown for cosmetics. They use the oil in different kinds of cosmetics. Uh, buckwheat is a honey that's very dark, uh, a strong flavor to it. Alfalfa is another rich honey, uh, a bit darker in color than clover um, and a bit more strong taste to it. And then there's uh, sweet orange blossom honey, where you can actually detect some of that orange uh, in the honey. And there's other kinds of honey too, like cranberry honey, raspberry honey, blueberry honey. Um, whether you like the taste or not is probably a matter of perspective, but I think these four um, have pretty universal taste and they differ in their appearance um, quite a bit as well. In case you haven't seen a, a meadow foam field before, this is what they look like when they are in bloom. You, you cannot actually see the green of the plants. It's just a sea of white. Um, I've seen it both on the ground and then flying over when I've, I've been traveling at that time of the season. And it's just really beautiful to see areas of green. And then you have a square where everything is, is white. Um, and it's a plant that the bees love. And it's this vanilla flavor kind of honey can't really find it in the store a lot unless you live in the in the northwest but it is available online there is one kind of honey however that will never uh, be kosher if you do hold to kosher standards uh, and that is honeydew honey uh, because this is the honey um, from aphids that harvest honeydew and from the sap of trees that have a mix of uh, aphid honeydew on them uh, so Although bees normally collect nectar for their carbohydrate needs, uh, sometimes they'll collect other sweet things that they find. There was a story, must have been a decade ago, about these honeybees in New York uh, that were collecting maraschino cherries, um, some kind of syrup that was leaking from a factory in Brooklyn. I don't think that was ever sold because it was an illegal leak. Uh, but you will find honeydew honey or uh, scale honey sometimes in stores, and that would not be kosher because that is considered um, a product that comes from a secretion, so from these aphids. So the last part of what I'm going to talk about today uh, is about integrated pest management. And from the entomology side, uh, how do we manage insect pests? And what are some of the best strategies for doing that in a way that involves less chemicals and in a way that is more sustainable. Uh, and then I'll close with a very brief description of, well, does, is this talked about in all uh, by halacha, by Jewish law, about should we manage insects and problems in a way that is more sustainable or do we do that in any way possible? So there's a concept called the IPM, or Integrated Pest Management Triangle, when managing different kinds of insect pests and disease. And the way this triangle works is we start from the most 
proactive um, way of management. So we'll talk a bit in the next slides about what do each of these mean, but starting from cultural control, these are trying to stop the problem before it actually begins. So making the environment um, not so conducive to insect outbreaks or insects feeding on plants. Uh, physical and mechanical control is like that, where you create barriers so the insects can't reach the plant. We have biological control, where you, as the gardener or someone growing um, food crops or vegetables, would release or utilize beneficial insects to stop pests from feeding on plants. And then there's chemical control, the most reactive form. You have an, a pest issue and you want to fix it right now. Uh, so you are applying some kind of um, chemical to that plant. So cultural uh, controls are about creating a environment in the garden that prevents it from being somewhere where insects are likely to find the plants or to reach levels of being destructive enough and feeding on them. So one way that we often mention in cultural control is good sanitation. And sanitation is a pretty broad term. Think about it from waste management and cleanliness, but it includes a variety of practices to remove food and shelter from pests during critical life stages. Uh, so that could mean when apples are falling down from a tree or you have grapes falling, that could be a place where maggots or different kinds of um, fruit flies would lay their eggs. And when they lay their eggs in those right overripe or rotting fruits, they'll find the fresh fruit on the tree that you could still eat. So cleaning that stuff up prevents them from laying eggs in overripe fruits that they find easier uh, to lay eggs in. Uh, other strategies in cultural control are tilling the ground in the fall, if you live in um, a northerly climate, to bury crop residue, removing weeds around the borders of different plants, um, or completely removing disease-infested plants uh, for managing disease. Certain kinds of spores or the uh, cells that fungus can reproduce in, if they stay in the ground all winter long in an in infected leaf, they can reinfect a tree the following season. Trap cropping is another kind of cultural control, and that's where you put some other kind of plant that you want to draw in the pests to so they don't feed on your main plant. So marigold is one that is used in tomatoes uh, for attracting certain kinds of insects that will be on the marigold flowers instead of the tomatoes. And uh, then there's also in the commercial agriculture world for potatoes. Uh, potato growers will often plant eggplants or maybe a tomato, two plants in the same family as the potato. And they'll plant a row of them or a couple rows on the outside of a potato field two weeks earlier to bring in potato beetles that will find this more mature um, plant. And potato beetles will find the more mature plant and then the grower just sprays this border instead of having to spray the entire field uh, for potato beetles. So if you have the space for trap cropping, that is an option. Another kind of cultural control is picking varieties of plants that are resistant to diseases. Uh, so there's been a lot of developments in the world of plant breeding such that there are many varieties of tomatoes or cucumbers that are resistant, meaning that they, the disease cannot develop on that plant because they breed a certain kind of um, cucumber that will not be affected by diseases like rust or different wilts. And you can find this information out on the labels of seed packets. There'll often be uh, letters on there, and th those will refer to a a different kind of disease that they are resistant to. And often you can find that in the catalog of the seed company. It doesn't tell you what that disease is. Good planting is another thing that can help plants survive. Uh, I see a lot of situations of plants being planted the wrong time of year, planted too deep, or just dropped completely in the ground with um, all their roots on them. And that can lead those roots to girdle or wrap around themselves. And this is an extreme example uh, at a mall um, where we got a 
a picture sent to our office of all these arborvitae that suddenly died. And we took a closer look at the picture and they left the ropes and the root ball completely on the plant. They just took it off the truck, dropped it in, covered it with soil. Not a good idea. Physical controls are about making the environment unsuitable so that the insect can't actually find the plant. So that could mean putting row covers over the plant or a screen, um, a deer fence if deer are the issue, or hand picking them off, so mechanical removal. Biological control is relying on the good insects uh, to manage the pests. So you are using living organisms. Usually that's other insects. It could be bacteria as well, such as Bacillus thuringiensis. And these are insects that most commonly attack the egg and larvae life stage of other pests. And with the right kind of habitat, having flowers around, a mix of taller and lower growing plants, uh, you're providing a shade and areas where these insects can hide as they are in search of pests. So this is free control of insect pests in the garden. The two main groups of insect natural enemies are predators and parasitoids. I talked earlier about predation and parasitism as two kinds of strategies that insects uh, do to survive. Predators can live in the ground like ground beetles and spiders, and then predators may also live on plants and be mobile and fly uh, like lady beetles and um, minute pirate bug. Lady beetles are actually a double bonus because they feed on aphids, both as adults as well as in their larvae life stage. So I get a number of questions um, sent to me in my office about what is this thing here, good or bad? And if you see something like this on your plant, that is in fact good. That is the larva of a lady beetle. I wanna talk a bit more about parasitoids because they are such a, um, an unusual group of insects that a lot of people aren't familiar with. So parasitoids are a self-sustaining a kind of insect. They can only survive if their host insect is present. So this picture here shows you the life cycle of one type of parasitoid that lays its egg inside of the pupa of a fly. Um, that egg hatches into a larva. And for the fly, it's bad news because you're, you're kind of being eaten up alive uh, by the larvae. Um, and then eventually that adult wasp emerges. Sometimes the parasitoid life cycle takes place on the outside of the insect. So this is a cabbage worm that's been parasitized and the larvae live on the outside of the cabbage worm. Uh, so pretty gruesome if you're the cabbage worm, but these cabbage worms feed on um, cabbages and plants in the brassica family and can produce a lot of holes uh, in plants that might not bring them to the market. So these wasps do a really good service. And there's a parasitoid for almost everything. There's parasitoids of aphids, emerald ash borer, uh, tree scales, white fly. Um, the one thing about parasitoids is because they're so small and they have to overcome the defenses of another insect to uh, survive within the body, uh, they're very specialized. Uh, a parasitoid that attacks aphids uh, is not going to also attack um, a wood boring insect and it's not gonna attack white fly. They might pick one single species or a group of closely related species to lay their eggs within. Another thing about parasitoids is they can lay a lot of eggs quickly. Uh, there are some parasitoid wasps that can lay thousands of eggs in a single insect. And again, these parasitoids are microscopic. They might be just a few millimeters um, in size. And that's a lot of new wasps that you can get in a matter of one to two weeks. So anyone who's listening or watching that has a garden, uh, I would guarantee that you have parasitoids in your garden. You just don't realize it because of their small size. Uh, the way to notice you have parasitoids is the parasitized life stages. So those larvae on the outside of the cabbage worm or changes in color in the eggs of an insect that's parasitized. Uh, but parasitoids can't be controlled very easily because they're uh, mobile and they fly to find their hosts or they're um, carried by the wind because of their small side size. So if you are looking to attract parasitoids, 
Uh, planting different kinds of plants with nectar would be one good recommendation to bring them in. And not just doing that in your own garden, uh, but encouraging your neighbors uh, to add beneficial plants as well. So you have a corridor of plant life that these insects can survive on. And then pesticides are the final part of the IPM triangle. Uh, we usually don't recommend doing using pesticide applications first unless there's a strong need for it, like your plants are all going to die without it, and that's the only opportunity to save it. Uh, but for, for anyone who does use pesticides, um, definitely follow the instructions on the label. Um, use the proper equipment for protecting yourself. So don't walk in flip-flops if you're applying a pesticide, even if you think I'm not going to spill it, I'm not going to leak anything on it. And think about the, the goal. Is it just to protect your plants because they'll die, or are you just make, wanting to make them look pretty? At a certain point of the season, uh, pesticides aren't going to do anything. Plants, when they reach maturity, are just going to look weaker, and pesticide doesn't always rescue your plant. So if you are thinking about uh, IPM to enhance beneficial insects, um, there are different kinds of plant lists you can find uh, online uh, that help encourage predators. This is just a partial list of some of the different kinds of beneficial insects and the pests that they attack. Uh, the insect world is really interesting, and it's hard to talk about everything about it in 45 minutes. But the main point uh, is that for every pest that's out there in your garden, there's probably a good insect or a parasitoid that wants to feed on it. And it's a matter of creating the right habitat to attract that beneficial insect. So the last part I'm going to uh, mention is about what does halakha say about pest management? Um, and I don't think there's necessarily a, a clear answer. I mean, the concepts of the IPM triangle weren't known um, 2000 years ago or 1500 years ago. People controlled issues in their fields or on their plants as they needed using the best kind of technology um, that was available. Certainly, if we can, it would be better to, both from an environmental and a Jewish perspective, uh, not to use um, chemicals when they are unnecessary and could destroy plants um, that would otherwise not need to be destroyed. But there are a, a couple interesting examples and one from the Gemara and Moed Katan talking about it being acceptable to mix different kinds of soil from ant holes of one type of ant and ant holes of another kind of ant. Uh, so the ants will attack each other and being able to trap moles and mice in fields. So the Gemara was definitely alluding to cultural and um, physical controls. Um, without using those terms in this section of Moed Katan. Um, but I, I think this would lend the case that if you have insects that are damaging your plants, certainly uh, you should be controlling them if they're needed for your own um, food consumption. And then in, in the Book of Devarim, there is the, the prohibition to cut down fruit trees in war times. And um, this is taken that most people will not cut fruit trees at all. Uh, so there are fruit trees in a number of Orthodox communities that the tree will never get cut. It's considered a very bad um, omen to, to cut that tree because it's mentioned in the Torah to not cut down uh, fruit trees. So fruit trees aren't very common, at least in, in New York City anymore. But when they are uh, present in you know, very religious neighborhoods, they are not going away unless that tree basically dies. So if you're wondering where can I find good resources that are science-based for diagnosing plant issues and finding answers, uh, there is a free service uh, a number of states in the US offer and it's called Ask Extension. And not every state offers this, but in Michigan they have it, New York, uh, New Jersey, uh, I believe California and Oregon and a number of others as well. You can ask any kind of plant question you'd like. What's this plant? What's this weed? There's spots on this leaf. How do I control it? What's this insect? You can upload pictures and you get an answer within a couple business days from 
a member in extension such as myself if you're in Michigan or a trained volunteer. And it's a wonderful service that helps thousands of people every year. And I would encourage you to check it out. And I want to thank you for listening today. And this is just a, a party trick of mine that I sometimes do, being able to hold and, and pet bees. But it, the trick is you have to know that it's a male bee because the males sting, the females do not. So you can put a male bee on your hand and uh, without any risk of being stung. And the bumblebees are actually quite soft and uh, and fuzzy. So if you know your bees well, you can pet a bumblebee and a flower. So happy to take any questions in our remaining amount of time. Thank you so much, David, for the great class. Um, I'm going to monitor and see if anyone wants to ask anything. Yes, Charles. Hi, yeah, um, that was very good. So I, I got a question about honeydew. I didn't realize honeydew was a kosher because um, as far as I know, uh, manna, man, that they ate for 40 years, somebody had a theory that that was um, some kind of honeydew. So uh, what's the story there? So I, I'm not familiar with this. So I think we're talking two different kinds of, of dew, possibly. I'm not familiar with the, the honeydew. There's, there's the dew from the ground that I believe that might be what we're talking about with, uh, with the man. So that do maybe moistening or adding no flavor. no i'm specifically talking about man there's what's okay. his name Fe i think felix professor felix who wrote a lot okay. of books in his one of his books and he's he's he figured that um manna what man from <laughs> heaven um which is the hummish says it tasted sweet uh -huh. um and he he went to the arabs and the arabs have have a collect honeydew which is an insect excretion of these aphids and into some arabic word which is like man so as far as yehuda felix is concerned okay manna as far as he was concerned was some kind of honeydew so the, my story is um maybe somewhere along the line people didn't realize that when they made a halacha that you can't eat honeydew um so all right so we, we'll leave it as uh okay. and, and, uh, something to figure out in the future i guess yeah that that's interesting because Normally, secretions would not be considered kosher, but uh, I'll have to look well, into that more. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm interested about this story about secretions, because a secretion wouldn't be actually eating the animal itself. It just passes through. So you're telling me that secretions are not kosher. Wait, what, is there another example of a secretion which is not kosher? So the, in that Gemara, um, talking about secretions, it, it mentions donkey urine as well, okay. which I, I would never recommend uh, no, consuming that. Not. But I mean, it's something that is is processed through the body, goes through the okay. um, digestive system, excretory system yeah. versus, I mean, honey, it's ingested and it's an internal thing. Yeah, I know you thing. explained that very well. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it like that. But uh, that's very interesting. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Um, I see that uh, Rabbi Shmuley asked a few questions in the chat. Um, so I'll read those out loud for you. Um, what do we know about the extent to which insects experience pain? Um, what do we know about their consciousness? Uh, for example, pain as well. Just could you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Great questions. Uh, I don't have a strong background in the behavioral sciences of insects. I can tell you that insects do have a nervous system, so they are able to detect motion, um, and they can probably feel pain in some capacity. Um, what those levels of pain would be, I'm not sure. But from the collecting side of insect, when we collect insects for use in collections, or if we need to kill them for research purposes, there aren't a lot of regulations with that in the U.S., not nearly the same as with um, other kinds of vertebrates or fish or mice. But in the entomology world, we try to make it as quick as we can. We, we don't want to prolong the suffering of insects when we are collecting them. So we would collect them, put them in kill jars or another um, kind of environment where they die rather quickly because they're probably feeling some type of pain. Uh, but what 
exactly that pain is, uh, I wouldn't know. Thank you for the answer. Um, we have another question in the chat. Uh, what are some possible reasons why you think the Torah might not want us to eat insects? I know that you said this isn't your uh, expertise, but just wanted to pick your brain. Yeah. So the the cop the cop out answer would be to say it's a hoax that um, we have it's felt which there's a rational reason and it's felt that we just don't know. Um, so I could say, well, that's a hoax. I'm, the Torah doesn't have to give us a reason. A reason, if I want to say it was not a hoax, um, the wrong insects, if you eat them or touch them, they can cause a lot of pain or or kill you. And there's insects that do a lot, that feed on things that are kind of gross. I mean, dung beetles, insects that are feeding on decomposing matter. Uh, so in some ways, insects can be associated with with filth, and maybe that's a reason not to consume them. That that can happen with animals as well, uh, but you can't control insects as easily unless you are rearing them. Um, so I, I would probably say it's a hoax, but the kinds of food they eat would be a reason that, personally, even if insects were kosher on a larger scale, I probably still uh, wouldn't eat them. <laughs> yes, fair enough. <laughs> um, another question we have from the chat. Can insects show any sort of compassion? I have seen some insects restrained from hurting another insect, but this could be just me putting human emotions into my observation. If anything, I would I would say the uh, the opposite. So a weak insect in a social colony of ants or bees or another social insect like termites, that's a risk to the health of the hive. So they'll just kick that insect out of the, the hive and uh, let them die. So it can be pretty brutal worlds uh, from the, the sense of an insect. The compassion that they might show would be for some that raise their young. There are some insects that they lay eggs and they leave never to be seen again. That's not compassion in uh, in my mind. If you're a parent to reproduce and sayonara, let them fend for themselves. But there are bees, uh, like solitary bees, that they will bring back nectar to their um, developing larvae in, in the ground. So there are insects that do want to put more investment in their offspring. Um, but again, I'm not aware of any good examples of compassion, particularly when it comes to social insect. It is about the continuity of the hive. So definitely for the queen, there would be compassion for her. They will sacrifice their, their life. But amongst individual insects, not so much. Okay, they said, interesting, thank you. Um, going along with that, I'm assuming based on what you said, the insects don't do any kind of mourning or grieving practices, but would they do that for the queen? If the queen is weak or dies, a, another insect will become the queen. So they wouldn't have a kind of shiva period. Uh, there would be some kind of change in the physiology of, of one of the stronger bees that she emits a pheromone, I'm the queen now. So not really any mourning for her. On to the next queen. All right, well, we are about to end here. Um, thank you so much for uh, your answers and your time and this new lens to look at uh, things. And it was really great to spend this afternoon. Um, so thank you again, David. I did want to just make an announcement before we uh, head out today. And that is that we are selling merch. So uh, this fundraiser is only happening for one month. But if you want to get yourself some Shemayam swag, make sure to head over to our campaign on customink.com slash fundraising slash Shemayam. And I'll make sure to put that link anywhere that this video goes. Um, and just thank you again. Have a great rest of your Sunday and Shana Tovah.